this street behind me used to be called the Hermann Göring Strasse. But of course, all that sort of thing's been forgotten about long ago here in Berlin. It's got some more respectable name today, but the main point of interest about it today is that through it runs the invisible boundary between West and East Berlin. It's astonishingly easy to go from one to the other. I'm in West Berlin at the moment. Now I'm in the East. There are a few policemen down the road on either side who will probably ask you if you're trying to smuggle anything, if you're carrying parcels, but who will most likely just wave you on and certainly won't even ask you for a pass. However, there is a vital difference between the two worlds that's marked by this boundary. You can still get 25 years in Siberia on this side of the line. You can't over here yet. The Brandenburg Gate at the center of Berlin marks the division more obviously, but here too it's only a matter of formality to pass from one world to the other. A lot of spying certainly goes on from both sides of the line, but walking into East Berlin you can't help thinking that if Khrushchev really minds so much about this he could tighten up precautions for a start. Superficially, the scene in East Berlin is less different from West Berlin than we're sometimes led to expect. There's some rather old-fashioned new building, and there are obvious differences, of course. But though, for instance, there's much less traffic in East Berlin than West Berlin, East Berliners don't look any different from West Berliners. Their clothes are good, their rents are cheap, even if everything else is expensive. And in the last year or so, there's been a distinct improvement in the standard of living and in the amount of goods available in the shops. The shop windows don't really begin to compete with West Berlin, but there are some brave and sometimes quite effective attempts to show that they can do as well. One thing you notice at once in the East Sector is the number of groups of small children moving about. Their mothers are at work and the state-run factories provide special facilities for looking after them all day. The biggest difference between the two Berlins is one that can't be seen on the surface. These are East Berliners too, together with other Germans from the communist so-called German Democratic Republic. Some of the 250 refugees who escape fairly easily into West Berlin every day. They're another reason Khrushchev has given for wanting to alter the present status of Berlin. For many various reasons of their own, these people could stand the communist German Democratic Republic no longer. Yes, I come with my husband and my two children because of uh, is many pressure into the school. What sort of pressure? Uh, political pressure and uh, religious pressure. Uh, anti-religious pressure? Anti, anti, yes, yes. What sort of Berlin have they come to? The most important thing about West Berlin is that none of these people want to escape from it. Sitting in a cafe on the Kurfürstendamm, it's difficult to realize that any sort of crisis exists at all, let alone that you're in the center of it. Like the inhabitants of any other big city, West Berliners like to get away from it all at weekends. They're now cut off from many of their lakes and woods, but there are still pleasant enough places left in which to go sailing or lie in the grass of a Sunday afternoon, even if it is sometimes a little congested. Here too, there's not much sense of crisis. I do my work, start in the morning and at the evening, and uh, at the weekend, like today, I take my motor car and then go out to seaside. Yes. I'm a little bit afraid, you know. Maybe the American boys and British boys goes away and then we're alone, you know. Maybe they, they leave us. I feel very safely in this situation. You don't uh, think anything could happen here? No, I think no. When you think of Berlin, do you think of it as the capital of Germany still? Yes. It's safe enough, I think. It wouldn't be safe, I wouldn't be here, see? <laughs> Do you enjoy living in Berlin here? Oh yes, I think so. You don't feel anxious in these crisis oh, no. days? <laughs> I have no anxious. <laughs> Are you aware of the crisis at all? Do you feel there's a crisis on? Oh, well, it's a crisis anyway, but 
You mean the whole you situation were... is one? Yes, yes, yes. But I think uh, the Americans, the British will manage it. Superficially, the most striking thing about West Berlin is the vast extent of the new building. Whole suburbs obliterated in the bombing have been recreated. Much of the new building is exciting and imaginative, making dramatic use of the space and light left by the devastation of war. And together with this new city, there's grown up a new generation. I think that uh, the uh, one characteristic of the Berliners is that in all situations, uh, they are very quiet, you see. And uh, when uh, Mr. Khrushchev in, um, in uh, Moscow held his first speech about uh, Germany and especially about Berlin, I think that whole, whole the world was very excited, and especially in, in Western Germany too. But here in Berlin, you, uh, you did not find uh, any excitement. And you still don't? No. We, are, uh, we have a, a great confidence that uh, I think the promises of the free part of the world will be held and uh, that we kept, uh, that we can uh, keep our freedom. Well, I don't feel too happy, but I don't worry about it too much. Well, don't you feel very enclosed and cut off from the rest of the world here? No, no, we have so many people from the whole world that I don't feel at all. I mean, I don't worry at all and I mean, we are in the middle of the world. Do you know any girls who have boyfriends in the east sector of Berlin? I know plenty of them. Well, what do they do about it? Well, they just hope that sometimes there will be one town or... I mean, they come here to West Berlin, they go to East Berlin too. The whole time they go backwards and forwards? Yes. How do you enjoy yourself when you're not working here? Oh, we have uh, different possibilities here in Berlin too, as in any uh, big town of the world. So we have uh, some nightclubs or any uh, or something else. What do you think of the nightclubs here? Oh, I think, but uh, by by the um, yeah, situation we have now in Berlin, that uh, this since the nightclubs are a little bit emptier, I see. Do girls from East Berlin come over here to buy their clothes? Yes, they do, but it's very expensive for them. They have to change the money into West German money. Yeah. What do you think of the clothes you see in the east sector of Berlin? Oh, I don't... Well, I like fashion very much, but I don't like the east... They don't have the material, so they can't do it too well, and the most come over here and buy themselves clothes over here. Yes, but you never feel you want to go over there and no, buy anything? No, no, never, never. That boy and girl remember nothing of how all this started, and they share none of the responsibility for it but there are still enough relics of the old Berlin left to remind anyone who looks for them that the present division of Berlin and Germany didn't just grow out of the air. It has its origins, of course, in the last war, and for that, the older generation of Germans have more than their share of responsibility. It's a responsibility which they're sometimes all too ready to forget. This Reichstag building was burned down for the first time by Hermann Goering to pave the Nazi road to power. It's now being rebuilt for the third time. 26 years later, Hitler's shattered bunker is the only monument to his thousand-year Reich. But today, even an anti-Nazi of the older generation looks back with nostalgia. Well, I'm living a long time in Berlin, since nearly 60 years. Eh? And before the war, it was very good to live here. It was, the food was cheap, and everything was very cheap. But you can still have a good time in West Berlin. Oh, we can have a good time if we go in the evening to drink some beers, eh? <laughs> and then we are gay. Eh? Living in the present is what Berliners are good at. The nightlife of Berlin isn't very exciting for an aspiring capital, and certainly nothing to what it was. But you can still have a good time there, even though the fun is a good deal more harmless than it used to be. For instance, every table has a number and a telephone.
By the hard reality of day, the Russian war memorial in the West Sector, guarded by Russian soldiers, is a permanent reminder to Berliners of their unnatural situation. But even the politically minded Berliner is remarkably calm and detached, as I found when I talked to the editor of Berlin's most important daily paper about the crisis. I don't think that could continue indefinitely, but uh, it will continue probably for some time to come. What do you think uh, really is going to come out of the present situation? That's a very difficult question, and I think uh, one could only approach this question if one asks what motives Khrushchev had when he presented his Berlin ultimatum. What do you think he had? And I think it wasn't Berlin in the first place. He always tried to get a summit conference. He created, a, he tried it at the Suez crisis, at the Lebanon crisis, and the, at the Kremer crisis, but nobody believed him that the world peace was really endangered. So he thought perhaps I have one place where I can create a very dangerous situation so that everybody believes there is a necessity to do something to preserve peace. And that is why yeah. this Berlin crisis was started. So you feel really this is rather artificial crisis? I, I think it's a very artificial crisis because nothing had uh, happened which uh, uh, had changed anything in the situation or made Berlin a more unpleasant place for him than it was before during the last eight years. Now, if, if I think that uh, Khrushchev was convinced from the beginning that by sending a note he couldn't possibly induce the American, British and French troops to leave Berlin. He must have had something else in his mind. And I think uh, what he really wanted, wants to get is a consolidation of the status quo, not the Berlin status quo, mm. but the status quo in Europe and in the world. Between America between, and Russia, you mean? Between the post two blocks of power, uh, yeah led by Russia and, Amer and America. Well, then, do you think he'd be satisfied with some sort of disengagement? I don't think he would, he would pay a penny for disengagement, because disengagement is rather unimportant to a military power of the size of the Russian military power. You know, the Russians, if he wants consolidation of the status quo, he wants peaceful coexistence for his seven years plan. He said so in his speech. And that can only be given him by America. Well, now, once he feels he's got this in this large-scale deal with America, do you think he would withdraw at least from Berlin? No, I don't think he would withdraw from Berlin. But the point is, whenever this stage has been reached where the two powers must come to terms, and I think that is when they are both in possession of serial production of intercontinental missile, missiles, then they must come to terms. And then the terms must include some process in phases of, German re of the solving the German question and German reunification. Do you think, as a Berliner, that your city will ever really be re reunited again in your lifetime? Oh, in my lifetime? I don't know. You see, I am now 62 years of age. <laughs> Other people, are, people who are 30, I, don't, I wouldn't give a, give a time limit. But uh, I'm absolutely sure that this is not the definite stage of the world in uh, Central Europe. For the moment, the state of the world in Central Europe looks definite enough. This village is on the border between West Berlin and the Russian zone of Germany, and the border cuts it neatly in half. East German police move beyond the wire like inhabitants of some other planet. At this point, the border actually runs down the middle of the road. Western traffic still moves down one side of the road. The other is overgrown with grass. This is the challenge facing the foreign ministers at Geneva. Is it really beyond their ability to clear this grass away? <laughs>